as we were singing that hymn, may God help us to let those words on the page be the, the expression of our heart. Because we do need to be made perfectly whole. And uh, as this hymn expresses so beautifully, it is by the humbling of oneself, the expression of a heart that realises that it can't do it. It cannot achieve it. But it relies on the merits of, and help of the, of the Saviour. And so our, our subject continues as we had commenced last week in reference to the discovery of self, the understanding of um, the quote from Ministry of Healing, which I want to read again now to, um, to pick up our vein of memory there. Uh, it came from Ministry of Healing, page 513, paragraph 4 where it said, we must have less in what we ourselves can do, we must have less trust in what we ourselves can do, and more trust in what the Lord can do for and through us. Then it said, surrender your will and way to him. Make not a single reserve, not a single compromise with self, know what it is to be free in Christ. Make not a single reserve, not a single compromise with self. Last week we concluded our divine service with Colossians chapter 2 verse 18 to 23 and there we identified an element of self in the very practices of reformation. If we come there to re pick up that thought there again in Colossians chapter 2 where the apostle refers to a self-motivated reformation. He says in verse 18, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. In a voluntary humility. In other words, I want to be rewarded like we studied in our Sabbath school lesson. We, Jesus was the king of glory because he was a servant. And so he humbled himself and to the very point of, the, of obedience to the cross. And so there are people who pick this up, and we are in danger of this because self is so rampant, that we say, okay, I've got to get there. I'm going to voluntarily humiliate myself. I will humble myself. And as we read there, we can say that with our lips and our mind intentions and yet we can be swelling, our heart can be swelling with the, with the pride of its own superior humility. This is called voluntary humility. And it, it picks up the instructions of God's word and it then applies them from one's own self where the instruction and, 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 and it doesn't hold on to the head it says in verse 19 and not holding the head from which all the, the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministers and knit together increases with the increase of God and then it talks about what we as reformers uh, in believe in, touch not, taste not, handle not. Right? So we don't touch 
Anything that the world encroaches upon our path, we taste not the corrupt diet and, and uh, alcohol and things like that. We handle not. So, and as it says, which all are to perish with the using. After the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. Yes, indeed, it is wise to be a strict, rigid health reformer. Because why? It's will worship. It's humility. It's neglecting of the body demands. You know, the, 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 the taste buds, the, the, uh, the appetite, we neglect that to not satisfy the flesh. So this is all very, very much along the vein of reformers, is it not? We're doing these things because we need to deny ourselves. And Jesus says, you know, deny yourself. <laughs> but the point is, it's not wrong, it's not faulty in being particular in regards to touch not, taste not, handle not, because that is brought out in other quotes in the Bible. But here he is talking about a voluntary, personal, self-motivated focus on that. And we dealt with that to some degree. In this hour, I observe another predisposition of self in our profession of faith, our distinctive profession of faith. What is our distinctive profession of faith where self can click in? Here it is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. 2 Peter chapter 3. Reading there, verses 10 to 14. <clears throat> but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This is soon coming. We can see it all shaping up, can't we? The day is coming. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. This is what Adventism has picked up and reformers who are getting ready for Jesus to come are picking up. It's very close. It's soon to be destroyed. Jesus will come as, an, as a, as a uh, thief in the night. And we've got to be very watchful here now. And uh, Jesus said it. Watch and pray. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace. How? What is our belief? We are to be without spot and blameless. We are to be among the 144,000. We are to be free of sin. We are to be perfect. And coupled with this biblical teaching, an ultimate condition of sinlessness, of holiness, that will be necessary if we want to see God at p in peace. We read it there in Hebrews 12. Verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Follow peace 
with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If God would come, if Jesus would come in his brightness, what would happen to those who still have sinned? They will be destroyed, as it written, by the brightness of his coming. Sinners cannot live in the brightness of God. So we must be sinless to meet him and not be destroyed. As we believe this, which we do, we become, or we fall into a, a trap of self. We become anxious and motiv motivated in a false way. This is our danger. Because as any per every person reads this and he believes what is written there, he can do exactly the same as what we were reading in Colossians. Oh, I must make sure. And I become voluntarily humble. And I'm reading here from Bible Echo, June 25, 1894, where it says, in paragraph 7, The shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. You want to meet him as your friend. And it's, it's very, very imminent now. We must hurry up. This is my incentive because the shortness of time is here. And this is used with a self-motivated religion. It says, this should not be the great motive with us. For it savors of selfishness. Think about it. Self wants to be saved. And so we look at this topic of the imminent coming of Jesus. It's right around the corner and we look at it from the perspective of me. That I want to be righteous so that I might have a reward and that I might be a friend of Jesus. And we remember the scriptures that Jesus cited where he said that um, that you know there are his the sheep and there are the goats and um, and they say have we not the goats say have we not done all this we have prophesied you have you have prophesied in our streets we've done all these good things and he says depart from me I know you not oh this is the this is exactly the point where you have preached in our streets. We have listened to you. You were our friend, weren't you? But he says, I don't know you. And all these kind of things send a thrill of fear through our system. Lord, what is it now? You see, it says there in our scripture that we read in Second, in second Peter that we are to hasten the coming of Jesus. So believing this, we become anxious. We want to hasten his coming by diligently applying ourselves to practice holiness without which no man shall see God. And as 
we engage in that kind of sense of urgency, self clicks in. That becomes my motive. Selfishness. That's what I read, didn't I? It savours of selfishness. The word savour is being used here, which is, it smells of it. It's a savour that comes up as, as a smell. And so selfishness comes into activity as an influence that smells in this kind of approach. And as this is the case, I read it from Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing and I read it here now again because that kind of selfishness that wants to be right when God comes and it savours of selfishness, it's the motive that I want to be a friend of Christ, I want to be, I want, I want, I want. Can you see this kind of mentality that comes here? And with that kind of mentality, I read from the Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, which I cited last week, in greater detail now. On page 123 to 124. And it's very, very interesting what this kind of savour of the intensity of the near coming of Jesus and my profession of faith. I'm an Adventist. And I must get ready for Jesus to come. I want to be there, I want to be rewarded, and all that kind of thing. And so, it says, that the effort to earn salvation by one's own work inevitably leads men, inevitably leads men to pile, upon, to pile up human exactions as a barrier against sin. We, we begin to examine closely. Oh, I've got to make sure I can help myself not to sin. And so we put up all kinds of barriers to make sure that I can actually stop sinning. For seeing that they fail to keep the law, they will devise rules and regulations of their own to force themselves to obey because I want to get there I want to make sure I'm sinless all this turns the mind away from God to self his love dies out of the heart and with it perishes love for his fellow men what happens? Inevitably? This is a self-centered kind of religion by which the love of God dies out of the heart and as it dies out of the heart, love for my fellow man dies out as well. Because in all our study of God's love that I have shared with you, generates a love to my fellow man. And so, a system of human invention with its multitudinous exactions will lead its advocates to judge all who come short of the prescribed human standard. As I'm reading this, let the Holy Spirit help us to identify our motive forces. To feel the pulse of our motives. The atmosphere of selfish, the atmosphere, that's what savors, isn't it? We're trying to get ready for Jesus to come. The, ex the, the urgency of it savors atmosphere. The atmosphere of selfish and narrow criticism stifles the noble, generous emotion and causes men to become self-centered judges and petty spies. The Pharisees were of this class. 
They came forth from their religious services not humbled with a sense of their own weakness. Here you can see voluntary humility. The sense of my weakness is not what I'm going to humble myself with. It's because I'm going to humble myself. These Pharisees came from their religious services not humbled with a sense of their own weakness, not grateful for the great privileges that God had given them. They came forth filled with spiritual pride. Remember? My superior humility. And their theme was myself, my feelings, my knowledge, my way. Well, where did I get all those feelings and those ways from? I read the Bible. I read what is, is expected of me and therefore I gain a knowledge and it's now my knowledge, my feelings, myself, my way. Their own attainments became the standard by which they judge others. Putting on the robes of self-dignity they mounted the judgment seat to criticize and condemn. The people partook largely of the same spirit, intruding upon the province of conscience and judging one another in matters that lay between the soul and God. It was in reference to this spirit and practice that Jesus said, Judge not, that you be not judged. That is, do not set yourself up as a standard. Do not make your opinions, your views of duty, your interpretations of Scripture a criterion for others. And in your heart, condemn them if they do not come up to your ideal. Do not criticize others, conjecturing as to their motives and passing judgment upon them. And what does Jesus say? Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. You see, what goes on in the heart is what God judges. And we can't do that. When we know that there are certain rules and regulations that we have made... We read Sister White's writings and we see there certain dietary expectations or principles and we ignore her statement that says do not make my principles that I lay down as regulations. But because we see that's what I must do to develop a healthy body and to develop a healthy spiritual mind. Therefore, I then t go a step further and say, this is now what we must regulate the, the, the lives of other people with. And, they, and the spirit of prophecy statements become legal exercises. This is what the spirit of self does. judge nothing beforehand. We cannot read the heart. Ourselves faulty, we are not qualified to sit in judgment upon others. Finite men can judge only from outward appearance. To him alone who knows the secret springs of action and who deals tenderly and compassionately is it given to decide the case of every soul. So here is where self clicks in. In the very subject of our profession of faith, we believe the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Sister White, are for our time. We believe that they have been given to us to prepare us for Jesus to come. 
And so we read them and we make legalistic expectations of that. Instead of connecting to the head as to what is written there. Because what is the test what is the, 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 the spirit of prophecy? It's the testimony of Jesus. So that's interesting. Shall I make the testimony of Jesus a legalistic exercise? Or shall my connection with him be for him and me that I may rejoice in his beautiful counsel in my life? And that I'm just happy to, to just listen to what he says and gives me wisdom and understanding, not legalistic expectations. Can you see the difference? And as we contemplate this, this, this being diligent, because his coming is extremely soon and I'm not ready yet, I'm not perfect, and therefore I must hasten, motivated by this selfishness is the source of, of motivation. This characteristic, as I have been reading it here, is it true that this is a rampant characteristic among reformers? This is unfortunately the reality. This characteristic is rampant among reformers because they are building up on this doctrine of the coming of Jesus very soon. Self comes in. And I hear someone say, you're very confusing here. We are called to be diligent. So I set my heart to observe diligently the minutiae of the instructions that are given there. And I'm still wrong. Is there something wrong here? I can't get my head around this. I set my heart to observe diligently the minutiae because when, didn't we read it there that God has given us the minutiae in the spirit of prophecy? Well, now you're telling me I'm wrong in doing that? I care about others to make sure they understand the duties and I press them to, to follow the same diligence that I am exercising here. And I become troubled when I'm showing them what they should be doing and they are not as diligent as I am. And in my anxiety I talk about them to others who are of the same mind as me. So that maybe they can talk to this person and bring him back around. And so we get different classes of minds, those of kindred minds on expectation of self upon others as we've been reading here under this mentality that comes from self that savors of self this is the, the, the place where self comes in and as we were identifying from thoughts of an amount of blessing and this is motivated by everything else but the head Christ Jesus And so let us return to our scripture reading now because I don't want to just unveil self in its manifestations. I want to unveil Jesus because he is to be the true motive force. We turn there to Romans chapter 13 verse 11 and 12 and we read around it a little more because here it makes some important suggestive connections. It says, verse 10 through to verse 14, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love, not legalistic. Right? Love. And how do we lose the love? When we as I read it there from the Mount of Blessings, when we put up barriers to stop us from sinning. 
we exercise legalistic barriers to stop us from sinning. But what is it that will keep God's law? What is it that will do those things of touch not, taste not, handle not in the right motive? Love worketh no ill to his neighbour. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Now, how do you do that? by those barriers that you put up, by those self-motivated examinations of do's and don'ts. It says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but what? Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. <coughs> now, did you notice there that to deny the flesh is still part of the exercise? We read it there in Colossians. The voluntary humility denies the flesh. But here it says... Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and then make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Here is a very, very important proviso or prerequisite to dealing with the flesh. It is not a rigidity that is going to deal with the flesh. It is the love of of Jesus that is compassionate and that has an, a far-sighted understanding of health principles, of dress principles, of the principles of, of the world, uh, separating from the world and all those kind of things. Everything is based on a different motive. It is the motive of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's explore that so that we can actually not only differentiate between the selfisms versus the love of God, but that we will also be motivated as we look at Jesus. To reach the perfection that renders us acceptable at Christ's coming is beautifully expressed by the Apostle John. Remember, he was the beloved... He writes there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Where he says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Because we must be perfect before he comes, if we are not, we're going to be ashamed. So the apostle says here now, if you don't want to be ashamed at his coming, if you want to be perfect without sin, then abide in him. Abide in him. Here is the focus. Not rigid, self-motivated reading of the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. You know, Sister White writes that there's much reading of the Bible that is very, very dangerous. You can read about that in, in the selected messages where she actually says that the reading of the Bible is for many very dangerous because they're not coming to the Bible with the right motive. We are to focus upon the man Christ Jesus in the Bible and put him on and abide in him. 
verse 27 makes it very beautifully clear there. But the anointing which you have received from him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. This is something we need to get our self-egocentric mindedness into focus because my egocentricism my self-motivation is not going to understand what he is saying here when I recognize that self is my worst enemy which we're gradually coming to see how dangerous this thing is then when I recognize this I will be under the anointing, the revelation of the power of the Holy Spirit upon my mind and heart, letting Him anoint me. And as the anointing which you have received of Him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Here is the focus of, of our need to be in an intimate love relationship with Jesus and with our Heavenly Father through Him. That's what Sister White was talking about when she said that the urgency of the time must not be made the central motive. The shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. This should not be the great motive with us, for it savours of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God should be held before us? Is it necessary that we may be compelled to right action through fear? Can you see how that connects with what I read? How we put up we are in danger of putting up barriers to force us to obey. Here is such a barrier. What is it? That the terrors of the day of God should be held before us as a barrier to not become worldly, but through fear to come and flee into the arms of God if we can put it that way, that was not the right, right terminology, to, to go and make sure I do everything right. That's the point. That we may be compelled to right action by that motivation. It ought not to be so. And now follow carefully. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. This connects us with that Sabbath school lesson of last week where we read there that he would, uh, he would not uh, exercise any attractiveness of any glory of kingship and of, of man's glory. Nothing at all. So that the only thing that would attract us to him is truth. But not only truth, but the truth as it is in Jesus. Because he was the king of truth. So the truth 
separated from the king of truth is not going to get me there. I must put on Christ. He proposes to be our friend. This is the attraction. And this is what I must abide in to reach a point where I'm not going to be ashamed at his coming. I continue reading here from paragraph 5 where it says, It is our privilege to have a daily, calm, close, happy walk with Jesus. If I will abide in him, what will I do? I will have a daily, calm, close, happy walk with Jesus. We need not be alarmed if the path lies through conflict and suffering. There will be battles with the powers of darkness, severe struggles against selfishness, and inbred sin. Wickedness prevails at the present time. The perils of the last days thicken around us, how true that is. And because wickedness abounds, the love of many waxes cold. This need not be. The meekness and lowliness of Christ cherished in the heart will give moral power to every soul. Can you pick it up here? I need power to get myself ready for Jesus to come. What is it that's going to give me the power? Not my fear that I'm going, not going to make it, but no, the meekness and lowliness of Jesus Christ which I can cherish in my heart. Are you doing this, friends, brethren and sisters? Cherishing in my heart the descriptions and the display of the character of Jesus. This will give me moral power to this will give moral power to every soul. And the victories gained daily through trust in Christ and persevering, untiring effort in well-doing will give us the peace which passeth understanding. Did you notice there the motive for well-doing? The victory that the trust in Christ and persevering, untiring effort in well-doing. Trust in Christ. And then the persevering, untiring effort in well-doing will give us the peace which passes understanding. And this will not cause us to lose our love. It's interesting, while iniquity abounds, the love of many grows cold. And the love of many grows cold because of their self-motivated rigidity. And so... The spirit of prophecy here tries to turn our attention to the attractions of the abiding presence of Jesus Christ, his wonderful love and character. And I read again from paragraph 9 of the same quote. This is June 25, 1894 of Bible Echo. And there it says in the ninth um, paragraph, it says, There is a work before us, to subdue the pride and vanity that seek a place in our hearts. And through penitence and faith, to bring ourselves into familiar and holy converse with Christ. Now here lies the work. Not the work of, oh, I've got to put my diet right here and I've got to do this right there and I've got to do that right there. None of that. Our work is to subdue pride and vanity that seek a place in our hearts. And through penitence and faith to bring ourselves into familiar and holy converse with Christ. 
That's our need. We must not shrink from the depths of humiliation to which the Son of God submitted in order to raise us from the degradation and bondage of sin. Did you catch that, pick that up? We must not shrink from the depths of humiliation to which the Son of God submitted in order to raise us from the degradation and bondage of sin. You see, if you're going to follow Jesus, it will be a different kind of humility. Because if Jesus comes into your presence with that kind of self-motivated humility, you will shrink from the humility of Christ. It doesn't gel together with self. We must not shrink from the depths of humiliation to which the Son of God submitted in order to raise us from the degradation and bondage of sin to a seat at his right hand. We must deny self and fight continually against pride. How much? Fight continually. Abide in Christ. We must hide self in Jesus and let him appear in our character and conversation. While we look constantly to him, whom our sins have pierced and our sorrows have burdened, we shall acquire strength to be like him. Here is the operative activity that's going to get us ready. Our lives, our deportment, will testify how highly we prize our Redeemer and the salvation he has wrought out for us at such a cost to himself. Our lives, our deportment, will testify. To what? That we have studied all these things and we know them all and we've got to do them right? No. It will testify how highly we prize our Redeemer and the salvation he has wrought out for us at such a cost to himself. And our peace will be as a river while we bind ourselves in willing, happy captivity to Jesus. I have just given you, through these words, the way by which we will be ready for Jesus to come. It is a contradiction of human expectation. But isn't that what we expect? Everything that God says is back the front to what we think. How shall I put Christ on and abide there? How shall I do it? We've just read here what we should do. But how shall I do it? And here I read paragraph 8. We can never have a clear appreciation of the value of our Redeemer until by an eye of faith, we see him taking upon himself our nature. It was interesting this morning in the Sabbath school class, this question was posed. How can a person who realizes he is a totally sinful person realize how to connect with the, with the Savior? Here is the answer. We can never have a clear appreciation of the value of our Redeemer until by an eye of faith we see him taking upon himself our nature. The capacity to suffer as we do. And then reaching to the very depths of human wretchedness that by his divine power he might save even the vilest sinner. Here is the precious answer, brethren. Savor it. Hold on to it. This is what I must occupy my mind with. This is how it must happen. I must see the value of my Redeemer by seeing Him taking 
our nature, my deplorable sinful nature, pondering it, appreciating it, letting it percolate the senses and the emotions of our life. That by his divine power he might save even the vilest of sinners. That's how he dis does it. Jesus died that the sinner might live and God's justice might be preserved and guilty man pardoned. Here is the motive force. This meditation, how little it is engaged in because what we occupy ourselves with is what we have learnt, the doctrines, the teachings, which is important. But we do it as the truth outside of our meditations in Jesus. It is our primary focus of abiding in Jesus and from that focus, from that motivation, be, become effective in submitting to all he communicates without legalistic expectations. It's simply the beautiful principle of love that I see in everything that happens. The Son of the Highest suffered shame on the cross so that sinners might not suffer everlasting shame and contempt but be ransomed and crowned with eternal glory. Why is it that we have so little sense of sin? So little penitence, why? It is because we do not come nearer to the cross of Christ and our conscience becomes hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What becomes hardened? Our conscience. Because sin is all around us and we do exactly what the Pharisees do. Love goes out of the door, out the door and judgmentalism and expectations of what we have learnt that other people must do or else they can't be ready for Jesus to come. So here it is. What must we do to abide in Christ? We must contemplate the nature of Christ being our nature that he took upon himself. And uh, if you come there to Bible Commentary, Volume 5, and that comes in the scripture, in the Bible, um, the study Bible, under, the, um, under John chapter 15, where Jesus says that we must be abiding in him as the branches in the vine. The, uh, under John 15, this is where Sister White makes this beautiful, important uh, point. In paragraph 4 it says there, Christ alone can help us. Who? Anything else? No, Christ alone can help us and give us the victory. Christ must be all in all to us. He must dwell in the heart. His life must circulate through us as the blood circulates through the veins. His spirit must be a vitalizing power that will cause us to influence others to become Christ-like and holy. You want to influence others to make sure that they're going to be ready? <laughs> Not by saying, hey, come on, you should be a better health reformer or you should be better dressed or you should this or you should that. No. What is it? He must dwell in the heart, Christ, his life must circulate through our blood, through us as the blood circulates through the veins. His spirit must be vitalizing power that will cause us to influence others to become Christ-like and holy. Not to Bible bash them. Not to spirit of prophecy bash them. But by a life that emanates Christ and his loveliness, we, will, we are to become, we, to influence others, to cause them to say, oh, this is lovely here. 
this is what I want. What do we see there in Jesus that segregates self? The self that we have so clearly shown in the beginning of our divine service. What is there in Jesus that will actually, as I focus upon what he is doing, as I focus upon every step of his experience and his meekness and his dependence upon God, what is it that will, that will actually achieve within me a segregation of myself? Let's read it there in the Gospel of John chapter 5. Verse 19 and verse 30. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. Here is what Jesus lays out before our mind's eye. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself. But what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now when, when, why did he say that? Why did he address that point? Read verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath but said also that God was his Father making himself equal with God. the human interpretation of Jesus was that he was making himself equal with God. He was proud. And so what did Jesus say? You are saying this, but look at my position. I don't exercise myself at all. This is Jesus. He does not exercise himself at all. He says, I can do nothing of myself. Everything I do is only simply what the Father has shown me. Come to verse 30. I can, of mine own self, do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Why? Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father, which hath sent me. Here is something for us to ponder about. What was Jesus doing? He had a mind of his own. He had a self too. Did he? Self is in everyone. Me and mine. The very nature of God is to deny self. If it wouldn't be self there, there wouldn't be anything to deny. Self is demonstrated as a denying item in Jesus Christ. If we come there in Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5, and we pick up on the beautiful spirit of Jesus, he could well have said, and I think this would have been what was his words while here on earth. Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5. Because he, remember he said this, I will do not do my own thing, I'm listening to what God says. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that ring a, a beautiful note of selflessness? Lord, I don't know anything. You show me. Not only show me the Ten Commandments, but show me thy ways. O oh Lord, teach me thy paths and lead me in thy truth. In whose truth? In thy truth. And teach me. I'm waiting on you all day long. Abide in him, remember? This is 
what we see in Jesus. He was totally dependent. He could do nothing of himself. He cried to the Father, show me and just get me to obey you. And you can see this in the book in heavenly places. You can see little statements I noticed in the bulletin, little portions of that. In, uh, in heavenly places, page 147. And here is the beautiful anecdote to self that we see in Jesus. Now I'm reading here from paragraph 3. Where many have erred was in not being careful in following God's ideas, but their own. Many have erred where? In following their own ideas instead of God's ideas. Christ himself declared the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. So utterly was he emptied of himself. Now, follow this closely. So utterly emptied of himself that he made no schemes and plans. He lived accepting God's plans for him. And the Father, day by day, unfolded his plans. If Jesus was so wholly dependent and wholly dependent and declared, whatsoever I see the Father do, that I do, how much more should human agents depend upon God for constant instruction so that their lives might be the simple working out of God's plan? as we behold Jesus, we get a, a glimpse of a self-denial that if you were to put into practice, you would get scared. You would really get scared. Oh, wait a minute, I, this, doesn't, this isn't comfortable. Isn't that what Jesus said? Let's read it here. Our own way must be overcome. Pride, self-sufficiency must be crucified. And the vacuum supplied with the spirit and power of God. The anointing, remember? Did Jesus Christ, the majesty of heaven, have his way? Behold him in travail of Saul in Gethsemane. Praying to his father. What is it that forces these blood drops of agony from his holy brow? Oh, the sins of the whole world are upon him. It was separation from the Father's love that forced from his pale and quivering lips the cry, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. As you and I experience the excruciating expectations that loom up before me when God says, this is my will for you, And you go, oh, is it possible that I can go another way? Hmm? What about Balaam, remember? Oh, is it possible that I could still go? <laughs> uh, Jesus had the right to say, do I really have to take all these sinful thoughts and feelings upon myself? But three times was the prayer offered but followed by, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This must be our attitude. Not my will, but thine, O God, be done. This is true conversion. This is true conversion. 
as we behold Jesus, it will dawn upon me what it means to follow all of God's will. In these times of iniquity abounding, in these times when my rationale and my planning of what I have read in the scriptures and what I think I should do, in these times as I seek to put my mind into harmony with what I'm reading in the Bible without my relationship with Jesus intact, listen carefully. Testimony, volume 5. Page 513. Volume 5. Page 513 in paragraph 2. Very, very fitting words to the dilemma in which we will find and we have found ourselves many times. And I know this statement as my personal experience very clearly in paragraph 2 it says you are often discouraged at finding yourself weak in moral power in slavery to doubt and controlled by the habits and customs of your old life in sin you find your emotional nature untrue to yourself, to your best resolutions, and to your most solemn pledges. Nothing seems real. Your own instability leads you to doubt the sincerity of those who would do you good. The more you struggle in doubt, the more unreal everything looks to you. Until it seems that there is no, no solid ground for you anywhere. Your promises are like ropes of sand. And you regard in the same unreal light the words and works of those to whom, of those in whom you should trust. Oh, everything looks so absolutely ridiculous when you follow the real thing, or you try to, because as Sister White describes it here, and you want to read this one again and again and see whether you cannot identify with this where you really discover that God's ways seem to be so totally contradictory to what I think I should do and because I'm so entrenched in this way of thinking and feeling God says there are people you should trust and you go how can I trust this man he's just put me through an emotion turmoil no I can't, can't do that um, that's what I read here didn't I it said here that that because of our own perverted ideas and the knowledge of our broken promises, our forfeited pledges, weakens us in our confidence in ourself and in the faith of others in you. That was, in, that was a paragraph down from that. That's very fitting. Your promises are like ropes of sand and you regard in the same unreal light the words and works of those in whom you should trust. Brethren and sisters, have you experienced this? And so in this dreadful time, in this horrifying circumstance, Sister White says in paragraph 3, your feelings, your impressions are not to be trusted for they are not reliable your feelings your impressions are not to be trusted for they are not reliable in paragraph 4 comes this beautiful conclusion it says but you need not despair 
You must be determined to believe, although nothing seems true and real to you. I need not tell you it is your, you yourself that has brought you into this unenviable position. You must win back your confidence in God and in your brethren. It is for you to yield up your will to the will of Jesus Christ. And as you do this, God will immediately take possession and work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. How many times have we read that statement? He will work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And why don't we find it? Here it tells you why. You must win back your confidence in God and in your brethren. It is for you to yield up your will to the will of Jesus. And as you do this, God will immediately take possession and work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Here is a beautiful conclusion. To will and to do of his good pleasure that is contrary to my natural nature, that is the minutiae of God's wonderful law, when I see it all in the perspective of my relationship with Jesus and the inflowing of God in my life when I'm willing to do what Jesus did, Father, thy will be done. And when that mentality is generated by beholding Jesus, the Lord will come in and he will work in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. May the Lord give us strength to go forward under this clear revelation of God's word, to embrace our lovely Jesus and to abide deep inside of him. This is my prayer as we continue to seek the differentiation between the love of God and self. Amen.